The trouble with old steam locomotives, part 18. Removing the connecting rod and repairing the second broken part of the valve gear. But before that, I'm going to take off the connecting rod and have a look at it. And in order to do that, I need to remove the return crank. And thankfully, this is secured to the crank pin in a more sensible manner than some of the other fittings on this engine. It has a pinch bolt and then it's pinned to the crank pin. The big red cross says it's not a good idea to do this as the hammer will mark the return crank. I used the point of my right angle scriber, which worked quite well, and it kept the hammer blows away from the return crank itself. With the pinch bolt loosened and the pin removed, it just slid off the crank pin. This is the crosshead, and this is one that I repaired. This is the part that holds the small end of the connecting rod in place, and originally one of the bolts was sheared off. I carefully drilled that out and re-threaded the hole. I used three brass 6BA bolts to hold the crosshead pin in place. Why brass? Well, the answer's quite simple, really. This is a no-stress component. There is no sideways movement or any movement at all. These bolts just hold the part in place. The original problem of the sheared bolt was probably just caused by someone over-tightening it. And if any of these brass bolts shear off, then they're very easy to get out of the holes. Here's the reason why I'm removing the connecting rod. There's a tiny bit of play in the bush. And by slight, I mean an awful lot, really. I was merely practising the art of understatement. This fossil bronze bush has to go, so I'm tapping it out with a hammer. Initially this way to see how tight it was. You will notice that I'm resting the connecting rod whilst trying to extract the bush on this piece of nylon. That's to avoid marking the connecting rod. Here's a good tip if you're going to knock out bushes from connecting rods. Use a socket that's smaller than the hole. The bush taps out easily without event. Sometimes this process can be painful, especially if you hit your thumb with the hammer, or if the phosphor bronze bush has been held in place using silver solder or Loctite. Not too much though, because if I clean this one up and make it look beautiful, and the one at the other side, the rest of the rods won't look good, so I'll have to clean those up as well. The outer side of the connecting rod was badly marked, so I removed these marks using some emery cloth, followed by using some scotch Bright. It's possible to clean these rods up so you can see your face in them, but this takes a long time, and to keep the job economic, I didn't see the need to do this. Have a close look at the state of the fossil bronze bush. This really is badly worn in every direction. The connecting rod on this side of the engine seems to be a lot worse than the one on the other side. I'll just micrometer the crank pin. The crank pin is undersized and I will take this into consideration when I make the new bush. It's time now, once again, to repair the valve gear. The problem is the pivot bracket, as I call it. It's very loose and wobbly. So just like I did with the one at the other side, I'm starting to dismantle the valve gear around the pivot bracket. First of all, removing these shallow nuts. And the nuts on this side are in much better condition than the ones on the other side. How strange. The link from the reversing gear is held to the pivot using a countersunk bolt. And from a bearing surface point of view, I don't think this is the best way to do it. Once I dismantled it, I realised that the bearing surface is the countersunk part, and it must work because it wasn't very worn. This pair of pivot brackets with the wonky pins are wearing very well, because the only time they're moved is when the reversing lever is moved. The main problem is the side thrust on the shaft, because slide valves, unlike piston valves, need quite a lot of weight and pressure to move them against the pressure of steam on them inside the steam chest. Once I lifted the bell crank off the pivot shaft, I realised that this one wasn't as bad as the other side. And thankfully, I noticed this before I unbolted the entire bracket. The pivot shaft is threaded with a very fine thread into the main flat part of the bracket. This one started to work loose, but it's nowhere near as bad as the other side, which had had a couple of very amateurish repairs attempted on it. Here's the pin, and as you can see, the threads at both ends are in very good condition. Without checking, just by eye, I'm presuming these threads to be 5 16 by 40 threads per inch. What I intend to do is lock tight this pin into the bracket, but before I do that, I need to thoroughly degrease it and clean it. I was messing about with some methylated spirit in an attempt to make a Stuart 504 boiler spirit burner work properly. 
so I emptied the methylated spirit out of the tank and into the Cerosol cap, after which, as you can see, I dropped the pin in there to degrease. And while that was happening, I took a paintbrush, got some of the methylated spirit on the paintbrush, and cleaned out the hole in the bracket, followed by cleaning out the hole using a cotton cloth. And once I'd repeated this process about six times, the hole in the bracket was looking very clean indeed. Here's a shot of the cloth when I put it in for the last time, hardly any dirt at all on it. And now it's time for some Loctite 603. This is a heavy duty retaining compound. It's an anaerobic adhesive, so when it's starved of oxygen, as it would be in the confined oxygen free environment of two threads in a hole. And that's what makes it set. I think plenty of Loctite is in order in this application. First of all in the hole in the bracket, followed by a liberal application to the threads on the end of the pin. I want a really solid joint here. Loctite 603 or not, I do not want the pin to be finger tight, so I replaced the nut on the top of the pin and tightened it securely using a spanner. This is a really good test of the joint. After about an hour, once the Loctite had cured, I removed the nut, but the pin didn't come out of the hole. So everything's looking okay so far. Time to reassemble the valve gear and I'm going to use some more Loctite, but look at the number, this is not 603, this is just a general purpose thread locker, 243. I'm going to give all the nuts a liberal coating of this stuff, and once it's cured it should hold the nuts in place okay. You cannot confuse Loctite 603 and this 243. Why? Because 603 is green and 243 is blue. These shallow, very fine threaded nuts are quite a good idea really because the threads on the end of the shafts are just long enough to accommodate them so they actually tighten onto the shaft and they don't put any pressure on the components that they're holding in place. Once again here I'm applying some Loctite 243 to secure the nut on the end of the return crank. On this engine I've seen many examples of alternative ways of locking nuts onto shafts using a centre punch around the edge of the thread. I don't like to use this method. It actually works okay, it holds the nuts in place. But after a while, particularly if you've removed the nuts a few times, the number of centre pop marks becomes a bit excessive. So I prefer a liquid thread locker like Loctite 243. And this coupled with the fact, as I mentioned before, that the small nuts on these valve gear shafts fit okay without compressing the parts that they're holding in place and that's because the threaded part of the end of the pins is just the right size. Time now to turn the locomotive the right way up again. Tomorrow is Wednesday and I'm driving over to West Yorkshire and while I'm there, I will call in at Blackgate's Engineering and buy some phosphor bronze of the diameter that I require to make new bushes for the connecting rods. Don't forget though, the connecting rod bushes have to be slightly undersized to suit the crank pins. So I can't just push a reamer through, I'm going to have to bore them using a boring tool. I'll make a video showing how I do this, because some beginners will find this very useful. The first thing I will do is make a couple of plug gauges to exactly the diameter of the crank pins. More about this in another episode. All that's left to do for this episode is to fit the buffer stock on the front. This, just like the one on the rear, is bolted to the buffer beam and the engine looks a lot better for having two buffers at the front. Now it's time to sit back and relax because I'm going to paint this other buffer stock. And just like I did for the rear buffer stock, I'm painting it very badly, so it matches the one that's already next to it. Just like in fact I did with the rear buffer stock as well. Now it's time to bid you all farewell. That's enough excitement for one day. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website. Click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you will find it very easy to find other videos that you may like to watch.